This audio production was made in collaboration with Audible Anarchist. Chapter 22 National Unity and the Decline of Culture Greece and Rome are merely symbols. Their whole history is just a single instance of the great truth that the less the political sense is developed in a people, the richer are the forms of its cultural life, and the more political endeavors get the upper hand, the deeper sinks the general level of spiritual and social culture, the more completely natural creative impulse, all deep spiritual feeling, in a word, everything human, dies out. The spiritual is supplanted by a dead technique in affairs which takes account only of calculations and neglects all ethical principles. Cold mechanization of forces takes the place of vital influx in all social activities. Organization of social forces is no longer a means to a higher ends of the community, something that has become organic and is always in flux. It becomes a dreary end in itself and leads gradually to a retardation of all higher creative activity and the more man becomes aware of the inner capacity, which is only the result of this mechanization, the more desperately he clings to the dead form, and for any remedy looks to that technique which is devouring his soul and laying waste his mind. Rabindranath Tagore, who, as an Asiatic, surveys Western civilization with something of detachment, has set forth the deeper meaning of these events in pithy words. When the organization machine begins to embrace wide territory, and machine workers become parts of the machine. Then the human person dissolves into a phantom. Everything that was human becomes machine and turns the great wheel of politics without the slightest feeling of sympathy and moral responsibility. It may well happen that even in this soulless performance the moral nature of man still tries to assert itself, but the ropes and pulleys creak and groan, the threads of the human heart become entangled in the gears of the human machine, and only with difficulty can the moral will call up a pale, mute image of what it was striving for. Therefore, national political unity, which always means technique at the expense of culture, is no nutrient medium for the creative, formative force of a people. It is rather the greatest hindrance to any higher intellectual culture, because it pushes all important social undertakings into the political field, and subjects every social enterprise to the oversight of the national machine, which stifles in men any urge towards higher ends, and forces all the impulses of social life into definite forms adapted to the purposes of the national state. The art of ruling men has never been the art of educating men, since it has at its disposal nothing but that type of intellectual drill which is set upon bringing all life in the state under a single specific norm. Education means the release of the natural dispositions and capacities in men for independent development. The educational drill of the national state strangles this natural expansion of the inner man by forcing upon him from without matters which, though originally alien to him, still must be made the lay motif of his life. The national will which is only a cautious paraphrase of the will to power, operates always as a crippling force upon every cultural process. Where it overbalances, culture suffers, the sources of creative urge are quenched because nourishment has been withdrawn from them to feed the all-devouring machine of the national state. Greece brought forth a great culture and enriched mankind for thousands of years, not in spite of, but because of its political and national disunion. Because it never knew political unity, each separate member could develop in freedom and could give impression to its own peculiar character, Greek culture grew great upon the minute division and complete separation of the efforts at political power. Because the cultural creative urge which throve so mightily in the Hellenic community for a long time greatly outweighed the power urge of small minorities and so afforded a much wider scope for personal freedom and independent thought, because of this, and only this, the rich diversity of the cultural impulses found an unlimited field of activity and were not crippled against the rigid bars of a unified national state. Rome knew nothing of this inner cleavage. The notion of political autonomy was entirely foreign to her leading men, and the idea of political unity runs through all the epochs of her long history. In the field of political centralization, Rome achieved the highest that a state can achieve. 
but for just this reason the Romans produced nothing that was culturally important, and remained a highly uncreative people to whom it was denied even to penetrate deeply into the meaning of foreign cultural creations. They completely exhausted all the social forces at their disposal in struggles for political power, which became more violent with each success, and at last loosed a genuine power madness. They had respect for no humanity, and could find neither time nor understanding for any other endeavors. The natural cultural endowments of the Romans were shipwrecked on the Roman state, and it struggled to obtain and hold world dominion. Political technique swallowed all original cultural enterprise, and sacrificed all social forces to a ravenous machine, until at last there was nothing left to sacrifice, and the soulless mechanism could but collapse of its own weight. This is the inevitable end of every policy of conquest, which John Paul so strikingly pictured. The conqueror, oh, how often art thou like thy Rome, filled with the conquered treasures of the world, filled with statues of the gods and the great, thou art surrounded by deserts and death. About Rome there is not green but poisonous swamps, everything lies empty and waste, and no hamlet looks toward St. Peter's. Thou alone swellest up with thy sins mid the tumult, as corpses swell up in a storm. But these phenomena are not confined to Greece and Rome. They recur in every epoch of human history, and thus far have led everywhere to the same results. This is a sign that we contemplate here a certain necessity in the course of events which arises of itself from the valuation that a people sets on cultural activity, or the pursuit of political enterprises. Let us cast a glance at the history of Spain. When the Arabs invaded the Iberian Peninsula from Africa, the kingdom of the Visigoths was already in a condition of internal decay. After their subjugation of the country, the Goths had taken away from the conquered inhabitants three-fourths of the land and converted it into endowments for the dead hands of the church and the nobility. From this there developed, especially in the southern part of the country, an overlordship of the great landowners, and with it a crude feudal system under which the productivity of the soil constantly diminished. The country which had once been the granary of Rome became less and less fertile, and in a few centuries was transformed into a desert. By the cruel persecutions of the Jews, especially under Sisabut, who was completely under the influence of the church, economic life was dealt a severe blow for business and industry lay in great part in the hands of Jewish groups. After Sisabut had caused a law to be proclaimed under which the Jews had only the choice of turning Christian or of being scalped and sold as slaves, 100,000 Jews migrated into Gaul and another 100,000 into Africa, while 90,000 were baptized. Besides this, there were the endless struggles for the throne in which poison and the dagger, treachery and assassination played no small part. Only so can we explain how the Arabs were able to conquer the country in so short a time, and with no resistance worth mentioning. After the last Gothic king had been decisively defeated by the Arabian general Tariq, the Arabs and their allies streamed into the country in great hordes, and there developed the first beginnings of that glorious culture epoch which made Spain for centuries culturally the foremost land in Europe. This is usually called the period of Arabic culture in Spain, but the designation is perhaps not quite correct, for the Arabs proper constituted only a tiny fraction of the invading Muslims. The Berbers and Syrians were much more numerous, and besides these there came also great numbers of Jews, who took a prominent part in the upbuilding of that great culture. It was chiefly the Arabic language which united these different race and folk elements. The country which, under the Gothic feudalism, had been laid completely waste, was in a short time transformed into a flourishing garden. By the construction of numerous canals and a system of artificial irrigation, the cultivation of the soil was developed to a degree never before seen in Spain and never since reached. In the fruitful fields flourished date palms, sugar cane, indigo, rice, and many other useful plants which the Arabs had introduced. Countless cities and villages covered the glorious country. According to the descriptions of the Arabian chroniclers, Spain was, in cities, the richest country in Europe, the only one in which the traveler, besides numerous villages, could find two or three cities in a single day's journey. On the banks of the Guadalquivir there were, in the period of bloom of Moorish culture, six great cities, three hundred towns, and twelve hundred villages. In the ore-filled mountain ranges, mining reached a pitch, which even today it has not regained. 
in the numerous cities moreover handicrafts and industry flourished luxuriantly and spread welfare and the necessities of a higher culture over the whole country weaving and spinning alone employed more than two million people in cordova alone a hundred and thirty thousand people were supported by the silk industry the same was true in seville the finest fabrics arras damask and costly carpets were produced in countless workshops and especially in foreign lands were highly prized arabic filigree and inlaid work were world famous spain at that time produced the most precious steel weapons the most gorgeous leatherware the most beautiful pottery with a golden glaze which cannot be produced to-day paper was introduced into europe by the arabs by whom it was manufactured in spain replacing the very expensive parchment in short there was hardly any branch of industry which was not developed to the most perfect state of craftsmanship hand in hand with this splendid development of handicrafts and industry art and science developed to a degree which still calls out our unqualified admiration while in the tenth and eleventh centuries all europe could show scarcely a single public library and could boast of only two universities that were worthy of the name there were in spain at that same time more than seventy public libraries of which the one in cordova alone contained six hundred thousand manuscripts in addition the country possessed seventeen famous universities among which those at cordova seville granada malaga Jaen, valencia almeria and toledo were especially outstanding many students came from distant countries to study in the arabian high schools and carried back to their homelands the knowledge they had acquired there which contributed not a little to the later growth of science in europe astronomy physics chemistry mathematics geometry philology geography reached in spain the highest stage at that time known anywhere medicine in particular made an advance which had not been possible for it in the christian countries because the church threatened with death the dissectors of cadavers artists and scholars united in special associations for the pursuit of their studies there were regular congresses of all branches of science where the latest achievements of research were announced and discussed which naturally contributed greatly to the spread of scientific thought the arabs made great contributions in the fields of music and poetry and their graceful forms had a strong influence on the posy of christian spain what the arabs accomplished in architecture borders often on the miraculous unfortunately most of their best works fell as sacrifices to the barbarity of the christians even where the savage fanaticism of the bearers of the cross did not level everything to the earth they did sufficient damage to splendid works of art by crude mutilation nevertheless structures like the alcazar of seville the great mosque of cordova and above all the alhambra in which the moorish style attained its highest perfection give us even to-day an idea of that wonderful period in the mosque at cordova which after the expulsion of the moors was converted into a christian church the powerful impression of the interior with its nineteen bronze portals and forty seven hundred lamps was in great part destroyed by a barbaric reconstruction so that charles v could with justice hurl at the church administration of the time the accusation you have built here what could just as well have been built elsewhere and have destroyed that which existed nowhere else in the world what gave the moorish style its distinctive character was the abundance of that unusual ornamentation of the walls and interiors known as arabesque since the koran forbids to the followers of islam the representation of men and animals in picture or image the fancy of the moors hit upon that mysterious play with lines which in its delicate and inexhaustible richness of forms so deeply stirs the spirit so that one may with justice speak of a fairy tale in lines wide scope was afforded to the art of the architect because the cities at that time were very populous and extended in area thus at the height of moorish culture toledo counted two hundred thousand inhabitants seville and granada four hundred thousand each of cordova the arabian chroniclers tell us that it embraced more than two hundred thousand houses among them six hundred mosques nine hundred public baths a university and numerous public libraries moreover this highly developed culture unfolded in a time of political decentralization which was uninfluenced by the monarchic form of the state even when abdurrahman the third raised himself to the caliphate he was compelled to make the most far-reaching concessions to the feeling for personality and the sense of independence of the population he knew only too well that a sharp centralization of the powers of the state would immediately stir up a conflict with the ancient tribal notions of the arabs and the berbers which might shake his entire realm the country was divided into six provinces which were administered by viceroys the great cities had their city governors the smaller towns their cadis the village their directors or hakims these officials were however in a measure only intermediaries between the government of the realm and the municipalities 
the administration of the latter was entirely independent, especially where whole tribes of family groups dwelt together, unlimited autonomy prevailed. Arabs, like Berbers, lived according to their ancient laws and constitutions, and permitted no interference by the authorities in their community affairs. The Christians enjoyed equal freedom, and chose their chiefs from among themselves. These latter, with the bishops, directed the administration of the congregations, and were responsible to the government for the fulfillment by their fellows in the faith of their obligations as citizens, and for the just collection of the taxes. The bishops were selected freely by the congregations, but had to be confirmed by the caliphs, who had succeeded to the customary rights of sovereignty of the Gothic kings. The civil affairs of the Jews as citizens were ordered in a similar fashion, their head rabbi functioning chiefly as head of the congregation. In fact, the rulers of the Omayyad dynasty never succeeded during the three hundred years of their dominion in drawing the reins tighter and instituting a more unified government in the country. Every attempt in this direction led to endless uprisings, refusals to pay taxes, occasional secessions of single provinces, and even to forcible deposition of the caliph. Thus, the realm was a rather loose structure, which immediately dissolved into its separate constituents when, in 1031, Hisham III abdicated as caliph, and abandoned his former activity with the resigned words, This race was made neither to rule nor to obey. Cordova then became a republic, and the former kingdom split into a few dozen taifas, tiny states, which no longer obeyed a central governing power. At just that time, Moorish culture attained its highest bloom. The little communities strove to excel one another in the development of the intellectual life and the arts and sciences, and the collapse of state authority did not the slightest harm to this cultural development. On the contrary, it rather furthered it by guaranteeing to it freedom from injurious political restrictions. In Christian Spain, too, one can see clearly how the tide of cultural development rises and falls according as the power of the state confines its activities within definite limits or assumes a scope which frees it from all internal restrictions and delivers to it all fields of social life. When the Visigoths were defeated by the Arabs, a part of their scattered army fled into the mountains of Asturia. There they established a miserable little state from which they kept up constant attacks on the territory occupied by the Arabs. Thus developed that endless war between cross and crescent which lasted over seven hundred years. Out of it arose that cooperation of the church with the nationalistic endeavors of the Spaniards, which gave to the later unified Spanish state its characteristic stamp, and to Spanish Catholicism that peculiar structure which it had assumed in no other country. When, then, in the course of those bloody and bitter struggles, the Arabs lost more and more territory, there arose at the beginning of the twelfth century in the north and west of the peninsula, a host of other Christian states, like Aragon, Castile, Navarra, and Portugal, which, because of unceasing struggles for the throne, were constantly in one another's hair, and did not emerge from this internal confusion until, at the end of the fifteenth century, Ferdinand the Catholic of Aragon and Isabella of Castile came to reign over the various states. In the smaller states there existed at first the elective monarchy, from which only later evolved hereditary succession to the throne. But even when, by the capture of Granada, the last bulwark of Islam in Spain had fallen, and the first foundation for a unified national state had been laid by the marriage of Ferdinand and Isabella, there still elapsed a considerable time before the monarchy could bring all the social institutions of the country under its control. In economics, in methods of administration, and from the political point of view, it was still no nation, as Garrido remarked. Its unity was embodied only in the person of the king who ruled over several kingdoms, of which each had its own legislature, constitution, money, even its own system of weights and measures. Before the unified national state could develop its full power, it had to get rid of the ancient rights of the towns and provinces, whose liberties were anchored in the fueros, or city constitutions. This was no small job. When the Arabs had come into the country, only a small part of the population, principally the noblemen, had fled into the rough mountainous land to the north. The great majority of the Iberian and Romanic inhabitants, as well as a much greater part of the poorer Gothic population, remained quietly on their ancient homesteads, especially when they saw that the conquerors were treating them with mercy and consideration. Many were even converted to Islam. But all, Muslim and Christian, enjoyed the advantages of the free local administration of the Arabs, Berbers, and Syrians, and this assured them of a wide scope for their love of independence. When now the Spaniards, in the course of this endless struggle with the Arabs, had gained possession of one or another city or a new district, they were compelled to respect the old rights of the community and to leave them undisturbed. 
In those places where the conquest had been preceded by long battles with the population and had been achieved either by massacre of the inhabitants or by driving them into flight, the conquerors found it necessary to grant to the new settlers a fuero, which guaranteed to them far-reaching local rights and liberties. This was the only way to get an effective hold on the recaptured territories and attach them to the victors. Spanish literature contains a large number of important works on the history of these city and country communities and their fueros, from which we gather that the city administration rested with the popular assembly, to which the inhabitants were called every Sunday by the ringing of the bells in order to discuss all the public affairs and interests and to adopt resolutions. The spirit which prevailed in these communities was thoroughly democratic and looked zealously after the local rights of the municipality, prepared at any time to defend them by all means at their command and to protect them against the attacks of the nobility and the crown. In these struggles, the corporations of the manual laborers of the cities played an important part. These constituted everywhere a very useful factor in the rich and changing history of the Spanish municipalities in which the affairs of the people were incorporated. Thus, Zancada remarks, Among the various causes of the communal uprising, there is one common factor which greatly favored that popular organization. This factor, which commanded great power, was the craft unions of the working population which had arisen as reaction against the tyranny of the feudal barons, and under whose protection the manual laborer was able to secure respect for his rights. These unions were, in general, an outstanding means for the betterment of the social and economic status of the craftsmen. As in other countries at that time, so also in Spain, the municipalities united into larger and smaller federations in order more effectively to protect their ancient rights. Out of these alliances and the city fueros, there developed in the separate Christian states the Cortes, the first attempts at popular representation, which took form in Spain a whole hundred years earlier than in England. In fact, the memory of the free municipalities, the municipios libres, was never completely lost in Spain and stepped into the foreground in almost all the uprisings which periodically disturbed the country for centuries. Even the cantonalist revolution of 1873 was undertaken in this spirit. Today, there is in all Europe no other country in which the spirit of federalism is so deeply alive in the people as it is in Spain. This is also the reason why the social movements in that land even today are characterized by a libertarian spirit, which we no longer find in the same measure in any other country. It was some time before any definite culture could be noticed at all in the Christian states in the northern part of the Iberian Peninsula. Among the remnants of the Visigothic population, social life retained for 400 years very primitive forms, so that one could not speak at all of any higher independent culture among them. Dierks remarks in his Gesiste Spaniens, The culture of northern Spain was, then, entirely different from that of the southern part of the peninsula. Here we see all branches of material and spiritual culture come to flower. The state organization, on the other hand, remained at a relatively very low level, and was little changed. Thus, the institutions which were formed in the north carried along with them the development of the state and the exacting control of legal institutions. This is a fact of the greatest importance. Of its significance, however, Dierks is apparently not at all aware, exactly because in Arabian Spain the power of the state could never really be centralized, culture was able to develop there undisturbed while it was for a long time unable to make itself felt in the north where the struggles for political power pushed all other interests into the background. Only after the capture of Zaragoza and Toledo did any great change appear there, and in this the Moorish influence was of decisive importance. Only Catalonia, and above all Barcelona, constitute an exception, for they, long before any other Christian state in Spain, reached a high degree of social and intellectual culture. This was owing to their intimate relations with southern France, which, before the crusade against the heretical Albigenses, was one of the countries most highly developed, intellectually and culturally, in all of Europe. Besides, the Catalonians did not feel themselves bound by the Pope's prohibition, and they carried on a flourishing trade with the Arabian states of the south, which, of course, brought them into closer contact with Moorish culture. Thus there developed in Catalonia a freer spirit and a higher standard of cultural life than in any of the other Christian states of the peninsula. This difference, of which royal despotism made the Catalonians still more vividly aware by its forcible suppression of their ancient rights and liberties, changed them into sworn enemies of Castile, and created that sharp antagonism between Catalonia and the rest of Spain, which has not even yet been completely overcome. So long as the royal power, which grew constantly firmer after the marriage of Ferdinand of Aragon with Isabella of Castile, 
was still compelled to respect the ancient rights of the municipalities and the provinces, there flourished in the cities the rich culture which had been transmitted to them by the Arabs, and which gradually stimulated them to independent creation. At the beginning of the sixteenth century all the industries were still in full bloom. As Fernando Garrido tells us, the Spaniards had learned wool combing and dyeing from the Arabs, and the weaves of Leon, Segovia, Burgos, and Estremadura were the best in the world. In the provinces of Cordova, Granada, Murcia, Seville, Toledo, and Valencia, the silk industry flourished and supported the greatest part of the local population. Life in the cities resembled the industry of a beehive. And along with the handicrafts, the arts, especially architecture, reached a glorious expansion. The cathedrals of Burgos, Leon, Toledo, and Barcelona bear notable testimony to this. Of course, the internal antagonisms of the several states, especially those of Castile, with the other parts of the country, were not at once overcome. Therefore, the royal power could not at once launch its attack on the municipalities, and was often obliged to submit to the control of the Cortes, which alone could supply it with the money that it needed for its undertakings. But the powerful Cardinal Jiménez de Cisneros, confessor to Queen Isabella, had already planned the campaign against the special rights of the municipalities. One of the most effective weapons in the struggle for the triumph of kingly absolutism was the Inquisition, which is often regarded merely as a creature and tool of the church, incorrectly. For the Inquisition was only a special department of the administrative apparatus of the kingdom, which helped to strengthen the power of absolutism and bring it to fullest expansion. Since in Spain, the efforts for the erection of the unified national state were most intimately intergrown with the unity of religious belief, the church and the monarchy worked together. Still, the church was in great measure just a tool in the hands of royal despotism, whose plans it helped to carry out, and to which, by its savage fanaticism, it gave that peculiar tone which is lacking to the absolutism of all other countries. In fact, it was by the Spanish kingdom that the Inquisition was first raised to that frightful importance that has loaded it with the curses of all later generations. In his book about modern Spain, Garrido gives us some statistics of the Abbey Montgaillard, according to which, from 1481 to 1781, 31,920 persons were burned alive and 16,759 were burned in effigy. The total number of persons who were sacrificed and whose property was confiscated by the state reached 341,029. This estimate, Garrido adds, is very moderate. Ferdinand the Catholic had already tried to impose limitations on the ancient municipal rights in various parts of the country, and had been successful in many instances. But he had to proceed cautiously, and to conceal his real purposes under all sorts of subterfuges. Under Charles I, the German emperor, Charles V, the crown continued its effort in this direction with redoubled zeal, and so brought about the great uprising of the Castilian cities in 1521. At first, the rebellion achieved a few small successes, but a little later, the army of the Comuneros was disastrously defeated at Villalar, and Juan de Padilla, commander-in-chief of the revolt, was executed. Almost at the same time, the revolt of the Germanias, the Brotherhoods and Craft Guilds in the province of Valencia, was put down after a terrific battle. As a result of these victories, the crown was in a position to put a bloody end to the ancient municipal constitutions which had been in force in the Christian states of Spain since the beginning of the 11th century. When, therefore, under Philip II, the revolt of the Aragonés was drowned in the blood of the rebels of Saragossa, and Chief Justice Lanuza was beheaded at the command of the constitution-smashing despot, absolutism was firmly in the saddle, and was never seriously shaken by the later uprisings in other parts of the country. So the unified national state was established under the dominion of an absolute monarchy. Spain became the first of the great powers of the world, and its political exertions strongly influenced European policy. But with the triumph of the unified Spanish state and the brutal suppression of all local rights and liberties, there dried up the sources of all material and intellectual culture, and the country sank into a condition of hopeless barbarism. Even the inexhaustible streams of gold and silver that flowed in from young Spanish colonies in America could not check the cultural decline. They only hastened it. By the cruel expulsion of the Moors and the Jews, Spain had lost its best craftsmen and farmers. The ingenious irrigation works fell into ruin, and the most fertile regions were transformed into deserts. Spain, which as late as the first half of the 16th century was still exporting grain to other countries, was already in 1610 compelled to import it, despite the fact that the population was steadily diminishing. After the capture of Granada, there were dwelling in the country almost 12 million persons. 
Under Philip II, the number of inhabitants had fallen to about 8 million. A census which was taken in the second half of the 17th century gave 6,843,672 inhabitants. Although formerly, Spain could not only supply her own colonies with all the manufactured products they needed, but could also export considerable quantities of silks, cloth, and other manufactures to foreign countries, at the end of the 17th century, three-fourths of her people were clothed in foreign fabrics. Industry had fallen into utter ruin, and in Castile and other regions, the government was compelled to lease land to foreigners. Above all, under the unceasing oppression, men had lost all joy in work. Whoever could in any way manage it became a monk or a soldier, and the intellectual darkness was impenetrable. Labor was so despised that the Academy of Madrid in 1781 offered a prize for an essay which would show that a useful handicraft in no way degraded a man nor derogated from his personal dignity. According to Garrido, Misery had lowered pride and slain freedom. Superstition brought about the most frightful of all scourges, that wealth fell for the greater part into the dead hand the mania for establishing primogenitors and endowing the church with property was carried so far that at the beginning of the revolution of this country the nineteenth more than three-fourths of all the land in the country was subject to servitudes one might here mention that it was just at the time of absolutism that spanish literature and painting reached its highest point but let us not deceive ourselves what was here produced was merely the intellectual precipitate of a past time. It inspired only a few of the foremost minds, whose works were appreciated by a small and dwindling minority, and awakened no response among the people themselves. Therefore, Dierks remarks very justly, If, along with the governmental ruin, came distinguished achievements in several fields of culture, if poetry and painting flourished vigorously, the fact must not deceive us as to the real causes of the general ruin, and it could not check it. Similar contradictions are offered as well by the cultural life of other countries. The surviving vital force of the people made itself effective in the only fields where, under the weight of spiritual and temporal despotism, it could be active. The high development of Russian literature under Tsarism is an excellent illustration of the correctness of this view. Anyway, this glorious upsurge of Spanish literature did not last long, and its sudden collapse served to make it all the more noticeable later. Italian culture never stood at a higher level than during the time from the 12th to the 15th century, when the whole peninsula was split into hundreds of tiny communities, and there could be no talk at all of political unity. During that period, the free cities were veritable oases of a higher intellectual and social culture of an astounding diversity and a creative vigor never since reached if we leave out of consideration the city republics of ancient hellas there never was another period in the history of european peoples which produced in so short a time so great a wealth of works of culture the english scholar francis galton stated in his works that florence alone produced in that strange epoch more minds of distinction in every field of culture than all the monarchic states of contemporary europe together in fact, the Italian cities at that time were like fruitful seed beds of intellectual and cultural activity, and they revealed to European humanity wholly new perspectives of a social development which later, by the appearance of the national state, the influence of business capital, and the growth of political ambitions, was diverted into quite other lines. In the Italian cities was born that spirit which revolted against the enslaving influence of the church. Here, too, the two philosophical currents of nominalism and realism reached their highest pitch, after having been vitalized by Arabian intellect, and because of the stimulus they had received even before the appearance of humanism, were looking for new roads to knowledge. For the real meaning of these two movements, particularly of nominalism in the later phases of its development, consists in this, that they were trying to set philosophic thought, which for a thousand years had been under the intellectual guardianship of ecclesiastical theology, once more on its own feet. Only when one becomes clearly conscious of the distorted thought process of Christian scholasticism can one correctly value this unmistakable change in the ways of judging spiritual matters. For four hundred years the thought of the scholastic was occupied with the most trivial questions, and lost itself in the rubbish of a dead formalism, which could open up no new outlooks to the human mind. For several decades Christian theologians quarreled over how many spirits could stand on the point of a needle, what sort of excrement the angels emitted, whether and how 
Christ had completed his task of salvation, whether he came to earth as a pumpkin, a beast, or a woman, whether a mouse which nibbled at the host devoured the body of Christ, and what the consequences would be if he did. These and similar questions engaged the minds of the literate for centuries, and their hair-splitting explanations passed as signs of the profoundest learning. In the cities developed the first preliminaries of the rebirth of science, which, with the ascendancy of the ecclesiastical mind, had fallen into utter decay. In 1209, a church council at Paris forbade to ecclesiastics the study of those writings about natural history which the Christian world had received from the ancients. As far back as the 10th century, there existed in Salerno a high school of the sciences, especially of medicine, where mostly Arabian and Jewish physicians served as teachers. These schools contributed greatly to the spread of Arabic learning and Arabic education in Italy, and so throughout the rest of Europe, by which the first stimulus to the reawakening of science was given. A long line of distinguished discoveries fall in that glorious epoch, many of which supplied the indispensable preliminaries for the great outburst of discovery at the end of the 16th century. The magical personality of Leonardo da Vinci, who was not only one of the greatest masters of all time in the most diverse fields of art, but also proved himself a thinker of the first rank in every branch of scientific research, and achieved, especially in mechanics, quite outstanding results, is in its astounding many-sidedness and the greatness of its genius justly the symbol of that wonderful time in which the creative urge of man achieved such powerful expression. In the cities, the handicrafts rose to a greatness never known before. Human labor came again to be honored and was no longer counted a disgrace. In the city municipalities of northern Italy, there were produced the finest embroideries, the most splendid silken stuffs. Every city competed in the production of inlaid steelware, splendid goldsmiths' work and objects of everyday use, blacksmiths' work, metal casting, mechanical devices, and all the other branches of handicraft reached a perfection which, by its inexhaustible diversity and its fineness and sincerity of execution, even today calls forth our admiration. What was produced in every field of art during that blossom time of culture excels everything that had made its appearance since the downfall of the Hellenic world. Countless monumental buildings in every city of the peninsula still reveal to us the spirit of that mighty epoch, in which the pulse beat of the community was so strong, and artists, craftsmen, and scholars worked together to bring forth the best of which they were capable. In the cathedrals and council houses of the cities, their bell towers and city gates, in the erection of which the entire population collaborated, is revealed the creative genius of the masses, as Kropotkin called it, in its full greatness and endless diversity. It filled every undertaking with its spirit, breathed life into dead stones, embodied all the passionate longing that slumbers in men and yearns for fulfillment, and knit the tie that bound them into a community. What then brought men together for a common effort was the vivid consciousness of an inner unity, which had its roots in the community, that invisible unity which is not imposed on the individual from without, but is the natural result of his social experience. Because man at that time felt always the living tie that bound him to all others, there was no need to impose social connections upon him forcibly from without. Only out of this spirit could a free production arise which released all the creative forces in man, and so brought the social life of the community to full expansion. In this way were the social prerequisites for the mighty architectural achievements of that great epoch first brought into being. Like architecture, Sculpture and painting ripened to a greatness whose like is to be found only in the Hellenic communities. From the creation of the South Italian school of sculpture in the first half of the 13th century, and the work of Nicola Pisano in Tuscany, to the masterpieces of Donatello, Verrocchio, Sansovino, and Michelangelo, almost every city brought forth its own line of distinguished sculptors, to whose abilities the spirit of the community gave wings. Never in so short a time were so large a number of important painters produced, such a wealth of great and greatest works brought to life. From Cimabue to Giotto, from the fresco painters of the later 13th century to Fra Angelico, Masaccio and Masolino, from Bisanello and Castagno to Filippo Lippi, from Piero della Francesca and his circle to Mantegna and his numerous imitators, from Lorenzo di Credi to Verrocchio, Ghirlandaggio and Botticelli, from Perugino to Bellini and Leonardo da Vinci, from Correggio, Giorgione del Sarto, to Tijan, Michelangelo, and Raffaello, distinguished masters arose in almost every city, and gave to painting an exalted status it had never known before. Many of the great masters displayed an astounding versatility, and worked at the same time as painters, sculptors, bronze founders, architects, and craftsmen. Thus, Bindamonte called Michelangelo the man with four souls, 
because he painted the Last Judgment, carved the statue of Moses, vaulted the cupola of St. Peter's, and wrote sonnets of terrific expressive power. In this way there was shaped in the Italian cities a culture which, in a few centuries, completely changed the aspect of the country, and gave to its social life a trend which it had never possessed before. At the same time, the Italian language also was developing, and with it the literature of the country. At first the style of the Sicilian troubadours was dominant, but the Tuscan dialect came more and more into the foreground, and, because of the rich culture of the Tuscan cities, steadily gained in influence. Poets like Guinicelli, Cavalcanti, and Davanzati wrote in it, but the powerful poetry of Dante first gave to the language the irresistible vigor of expression, the plastic form and delicate coloring, which enabled the poet to depict everything that stirs the souls of man. Along with Dante worked Petrarch and Boccaccio to shape that instrument of the soul, a language. That splendid culture which spread from Italy over most of the cities of Europe, and in them also gave the impulse to a reshaping of social life unfolded at a time when the country was completely split up politically, and the idea of national unity had as yet no power over the minds of men. The whole country was covered with a network of self-contained communities which defended their local independence with the same zeal as did the city republics of ancient Hellas. In the municipality, artists and craftsmen in their brotherhoods and guilds cooperated in a common task. The guilds were not merely the directors and administrators of economic life, they constituted also the sole basis for the political structure of the community. There were no political parties nor professional politicians in the modern sense. Each guild elected its representatives to the municipal council, where they carried out the instructions of their organizations and tried by conference with the delegates from other organizations to reach a settlement of all important questions on the basis of free agreement. And since every guild felt itself closely identified with the general interests of the city, things were decided by the vote of the corporations represented. The same procedure held in the Federation of Cities, the tiniest market town had the same rights as the richest municipality, since it had joined the alliance of its own free choice and had the same interest in its efficiency as all the other communities. At the same time, every guild within the city and every city within the Federation remained an independent organism which had control of its own finances, its own courts, its own administration, and could make and dissolve treaties with other associations on its own motion. Only the common requirements of the same tasks and the same interests brought these several guilds and municipalities together into corporate bodies of similar type, so that they might carry out plans of wider scope. The great advantage of this system lay in the fact that each member of a guild, as well as the representatives of the guild and the corporation, could easily keep track of all its functioning. Everyone was dealing with matters which he understood exactly, and making decisions about them, matters about which he could speak as expert and connoisseur. If one compares this institution with the legislative and administrative bodies of the modern state, its moral superiority becomes instantly apparent. Neither the voter today, nor the man who is said to represent him, is in a position that enables him to supervise in any degree, not to say completely, the monstrous mechanism of the central political apparatus. Every delegate is compelled almost every day to decide upon questions of which he has no personal knowledge, and about which he must rely on the judgment of others. That such a system must inevitably lead to the worst sort of maladjustment and injustice is indisputable, and since the individual voter is, for the same reason, in no better position to keep track of and to control the acts of his so-called representatives, the cast of professional politicians, many of whom have in view only their own advantage, is able more easily to profit by the confusion, and the gate is open wide for every kind of moral corruption. Next to these notorious evils which are today so unambiguously and so glaringly evident in every parliamentary state, the so-called centralized representation is the greatest hindrance to any social progress, standing in direct contradiction to all principles of natural development. Experience teaches us that every social innovation first permeates one little circle and only gradually achieves general recognition. For just this reason, federalism offers the best security for unrestricted development, since it leaves to every community the possibility of trying out within its own circle any measures which it may think fitted to advance the welfare of its citizens. The community is, therefore, in a position to apply practical tests and so to subject immediately to the proof of positive experience any proposed innovations. It thus exerts an enlivening and stimulating influence upon neighboring communities, which are thus themselves put in a position to judge of the fitness or unfitness of the innovations. With the central representative bodies of our time, such an education in social views is completely excluded. In such a structure, in the very nature of things, the most backward sections of the country have the strongest representation. Instead of the most advanced and intellectually active communities leading the others by their example, we have just the opposite. 
the most downright mediocrity is always in the saddle, and every impulse toward innovation is nipped in the bud. The most backward and intellectually sluggish sections of the country put fetters on the culturally most developed groups and cripple their initiative by their opposition. The best electoral system cannot alter this fact. It often serves only to make the situation harsher and more hopeless, for the reactionary germ lies in the system of central representation and is not at all affected by the varying forms of the suffrage. If one compares the superlative culture of the great federalistic epoch in Italy with the rubbish culture of the unified national state, which had hovered so long before the eyes of Italian patriots as the highest goal of their ambition, one comprehends at once the enormous difference between the two organizations. Their cultural outcomes were quite as different as the intellectual assumptions underlying their whole social structure. The adherents of national unity, and especially Mazzini, who had staked his very life on this idea, were firmly convinced that a united Italy was destined to march at the van of all the peoples of Europe to initiate a new period in human history. With all the visionary exaltation of his political mysticism, Mazzini declares, In me survives the faith in Rome. Within the walls of Rome, life has twice unfolded as a unity of the world, while other peoples vanished forever after the completion of a fleeting destiny, and none came twice to the front. Life there went on eternal, and death was never known. Why should there not arise out of a third Rome an Italian people whose emblem floats before me? Why not arise a third and greater unity, which shall set in harmony earth and heaven, right and duty, which, not to the individual but to the peoples, to the free and equal, shall speak a luminous, unifying word about their mission in this earthly veil? Mazzini believed in the divine destiny of Italy in the coming history of Europe with the mystic rapture of one divinely possessed. For him, it was the intellectual concept of the Unita Italiana through which alone could the historic mission of Italy be set to work. For him, national unity was first of all a question of power, for, though the people was always on his lips, still this people remained for him always an abstract concept, which he constantly strove to adapt to the requirements of his national state. Only out of political unity could Italy acquire the strength which would fit it for the fulfillment of its alleged mission. Hence Mazzini's outcry against federalism. This young Italy is unitary, for without unity there is no real nation, because without unity there is no power. And Italy, surrounded by unitary nations which are strong and jealous, must, above all, be powerful. Federalism would reduce it to the powerless condition of Switzerland, and under stress of necessity it would fall under the influence of one or another of the neighboring nations. Federalism would give new life to the rivalries of different localities, which today are quenched, and so lead Italy back to the Middle Ages. Seeking the destruction of the unity of the great Italian family, federalism would render utterly vain the mission that Italy is called to fulfill for humanity. Mazzini and his adherents hoped from the erection of the unified national state a mighty upsurge of Italian culture, which, once it was freed from the fetters of foreign domination, would unfold to an undreamed-of greatness. Before everything, however, Italian unity was to establish the freedom of the people and put an end to every type of slavery. How often had the Italian patriots celebrated in extravagant words the natural urge toward freedom of the Italians, and with a quite a special pride boasted of it to the French. Carlo Pisacane, the fiery socialist patriot, who was, it is true, no adherent of Mazzini's political metaphysics, though he esteemed him highly as a man, and who gave his life for the liberation of his country in 1851, in his great work, such historico politico militari sul Italia passes a very unfavorable judgment on the French. He called them a people without a sense of freedom, who indeed always had freedom on their lips, but inwardly were completely enslaved, and moved by their thirst for glory, cast themselves on the neck of any despot who came along. With this he contrasted the instinctive love of freedom of the Italians, who could never be induced in sheepish surrender to assign their destiny to a dynasty and he kept repeating that a united Italy could never be built by the power of a privileged minority, but must arise from the freedom of the people. Mazzini and his followers had no better opinion of France, and made no secret of their sentiments. These men had no slightest intimation that their efforts must lead immediately to just that condition which they urged against the French as a reproach. No unified state has thus far opened new outlooks to cultural aspirations, but has always led to the degradation of all higher cultural forms. Every national political unity results in an extension of the struggle of small minorities for political power, which always has to be purchased by a lowering of intellectual culture. Above all, however, national unity has never yet established the freedom of a people, but has always merely reduced its implicit slavery to a definite norm, 
which is then proclaimed as freedom. Though Pisacane might cherish the illusion that a genuine nation could harbor in its bosom no privileged classes, orders, or castes, Experience has thus far always shown us that the national state is constantly busied in setting up new privileges and in dividing the people into castes and orders, because its very existence is based on this division. How clearly and forcibly had Proudhon told Mazzini and his adherents what Italian unity would bring to the people. Every original characteristic in the various districts of a country is lost by the centralization of its public life, for that is the proper name for this so-called unity a centralized state of 26 million souls, such as Italy would become, suppresses all liberties of the provinces and municipalities in favor of a higher power, the government. What is this unity of the nation in reality? It is the merging of the separate folk groups in which men live, and which differ from one another, into the abstract idea of a nation, in which no one breathes, and no one is acquainted with another. To govern 26 million people who have been robbed of all dominion over themselves calls for a gigantic machine, then to set this machine in motion, a monstrous bureaucracy, a legion of officials, to protect it from within and without there is required a standing army, officers, soldiers, mercenaries. These will, from now on, represent the nation. Fifteen years ago the number of officials in France was estimated at 600,000. The number has not diminished since the coup d'etat. The strength of the army and the navy is proportionate to this number. All this is indispensable to unity. This is the usual cost of a state, a cost which, because of centralization, is constantly increasing, while the freedom of the provinces is constantly diminishing. This grandiose unity calls for fame, glitter, luxury, an imposing civil list, embassies, pensions, benefices, and so on. In such a unified state, everyone has his hand out, and who can count the chiselers? The people. Who says unified nation means a nation that is sold to its government, and the profits of such a unified regimen? They are not for the people, but for the ruling classes and castes in the state. The brilliant Frenchman had recognized clearly the moving principle of efforts at unity. Everything which he prophesied for the Italians has been made good to the very last letter. If Piscicane and his friends believed that only in France could it happen that an entire nation would put itself in the hands of any adventurer who made great promises, and especially who gratified their thirst for glory, the example of Mussolini has since shown us that national political unity prepared Italy for exactly the same sort of thing. For this also is a result of governmental centralization. The more completely personal initiative and the impulse to self-reliance is smothered in man, the stronger in him becomes the belief in the strong man who is to end all his troubles. Moreover, this belief is just a bit of political religion which is deeply implanted in the nature of man by the feeling of dependence on a higher power. What Proudhon so clearly foresaw, because his mental perspective was not clouded by blind faith in the state, our modern socialists, from social democracy to the various factions of Russian Bolshevism, cannot see, even today, because the eggshells of their Jacobin ancestors still stick to them. National unity brought to Italy only the bureaucratizing of public affairs and the debasement of higher cultural activity for the advantage of the political plans of its statesmen and their mistress, the bourgeoisie. The delight of the modern bourgeoisie in the unified state is so great merely because it opens an outlook for their policy of exploitation such as a federation of small communities could never afford. For the material interests of small minorities in a country, the unified national state has always been a blessing. For the freedom of the people and the shaping of higher forms of culture, it has always been a misfortune. How the efforts at centralization of the unified national state worked out in France has been shown in the first part of this work. Here, too, the accumulation of all political authority in the hands of the king went on at the expense of all the local rights and liberties of the municipalities and the provinces, till it reached the dimensions of that unbounded policy of world power typified by Louis the Fourteenth, and plunged France and the continent of Europe into an abyss of misery and intellectual barbarism. One must not allow himself to be blinded by the pompous splendor of the French court which brought in poets and artists from all over the world to strengthen its prestige and to deify the person of the ruler. For the French autocracy, art served to the same ends as formerly for the Roman Caesars. The monarchistic state in no way advanced the development of a popular literature and art, as is so often thoughtlessly asserted. On the contrary, it first created the wide gulf between the people and literature, which in no other country was so sharply apparent as in France of the Ancien Régime. This came about because French despotism pursued its aims with a rare consistency and was always intent on subjecting to its will every sphere of social life in order to implant the spirit of authority in every stratum of the people. Before the effective establishment of the monarchy, 
a rich culture flourished in the cities of france especially in the southern part of the country where intellectual life was freer and more active than in the north the most important stronghold of royal power and ecclesiastic scholasticism the lyric poetry of medieval france extraordinarily rich in content owes much to the graceful flexibility of the provencal language even more important it drew upon popular sources and found its surest basis in life itself the poetic spirit of the south hovered about the provencal minnesingers and troubadours and gave to their art its form and its implicit moving force but the troubadours were not merely singers of ballads they were also the heralds of popular opinion and their sieventes or battle hymns influenced social events to a high degree in these songs there stands out strongly a burning hatred for rome and the domination of the church not for nothing was the south the land of heretics and dissenting sects feared in equal measure by pope and king the fabliaux strange mixture of epic and didactic poetry which were sung or recited by wandering minstrels and which concerned themselves with everything which gave purpose or content to the life of man had an even deeper hold on the people in these songs satire played an important part and not rarely served to set public opinion in motion the christian mystery plays which often had a genuinely insidious and blasphemous content attained also in medieval france their first regularly artistic form out of which the drama was later developed at that time there still existed an intrinsic alliance between the people and literature and with francois villon who has been called the actual creator of french poetic art this alliance is evident in every strophe his great testament provides glorious evidence of this likewise rabelais the brilliant satirist and opponent of romanticism who understood his time better than any other man stood with both feet in the life of the people so that his two immortal works gargantua and pantagruel remain to-day genuine folk books with the victory of absolutism and the unified national state this relation was changed fundamentally this became quickly apparent after louis the eleventh that sinister being who has been called the spider of europe and who carried out his plans with a mad obsession that shrank from no means that promised success had broken the resistance of his great vassals and so laid the actual foundation for the absolutist unified state francis i who is generally acclaimed as having made available to frenchmen the higher intellectual culture of the italian renaissance selected machiavelli's prince as his model and in his patronage of classic studies pursued a quite definite political purpose in the old fabliaux mystery plays and folk songs there still lived the memory of a past which had tried to free itself from royal despotism francis determined that from that time on poetry was to avail itself of classical material and turn its mind toward rome instead of attaching itself to the customs and institutions of an epoch which might awaken in the people a yearning for the things they had lost what francis i had begun his successors and their priestly satellites carried on with stubborn zeal so literature became court literature and entirely estranged from the people poets no longer drew upon the rich popular sources which under despotic domination withered more and more as once in rome so now at versailles and in paris all art revolved about the person of the king and the sanctified institution of the monarchy men took every conceivable pains to bind poetic creation by fixed rules and sacrificed the living spirit to a dead erudition which had lost all relation to real life everything was regimented and bureaucratically ordained even the language all the instruments of power had been earlier employed to eradicate along with the heretics of the south also their language the provencal in sixteen thirty five richelieu established the french academy in order to subordinate language and poetry to the authoritarian ambitions of absolutism only what from above was found correct in style and unobjectionable was to be allowed to achieve immortality nothing else had a right to exist boileau in his art poetique gave to poetry in general a definite plumb-line which was followed with slavish assiduity not only in france but in other countries and for so long a time it closed every new outlook for the development of literary art all the french classics suffer from this restriction of the spirit and seem to us unrelated to the world and lacking in inner warmth when corneille was so daring as to disregard the prescribed rules in his cid the cardinal quickly made him see reason by setting the academy in action against him thus it had happily come to pass that language literature and art were bureaucratized can one wonder that even voltaire who in his dramatic works went the academic way found shakespeare a savage
only a few poets of that enslaved period constitute a glorious exception. First of all comes Molière, the unique, in whom the spirit of Rabelais still lived and gave to his genius the power to overstep the narrow bounds and to tear the solemn mask of vain pretense from the hypocritical countenance of his time. No wonder that the French Academy failed to add his name to the troop of the immortals, or that the Archbishop of Paris threatened readers of Tartuffe with excommunication. Perhaps it was fortunate for the poet that he died young. Such a rebellious head as his was exposed to dangers of many kinds in that time of rigid forms and majestic mendacity. La Fontaine, too, and Le Sage must be named here. The exquisite fables of the former have kept their freshness of coloring because he discarded rigid rules and turned back to the inexhaustible wealth of ideas of the old Fabliau. Le Sage, who with such masterly skill has told those wholesome truths to his contemporaries in The Devil on Two Sticks and his delightful Gil Blas, was the actual creator of the modern novel. It was at that time, too, when every expression of life was adjusted to the spirit of authority and absolutism, that Bossuet wrote his Discours sur l'histoire universelle, thus becoming the founder of the theological concept of history, purposing to proclaim the system of royal despotism as a divinely ordained reality over which man had no power, since its foundations lay in the plan of providence itself. Every revolt against the system, or the sacred person of the monarch, became a revolt against God, and a capital crime against church and state. The unintelligent theology which was then taught in the Sorbonne permitted no scientific explanations. Thus, the church rendered invaluable service to the temporal despotism, for it left no means untried to plant the principle of authority deep in the consciousness of every subject. And it was not only language, art, and literature that were placed under the control of a special authority. Crafts and industry also were brought under regimentation by the state and could no longer make independent decisions. Definite methods were prescribed by the state for all the industries in the country, and an army of officials took care that no one of them deviated by a hair's breadth from the established norm. In his great work, De l'Industrie Française, Jean de Chaptal has pictured the whole monstrosity of this crazy system in its every detail, and has shown how every creative instinct was deliberately smothered and every new idea condemned to suppression. Thus, the tailor was told how many stitches to use in sewing a sleeve into a coat, the cooper how many hoops he must put on a barrel. The state bureaucracy not only determined the length, width, and color of the fabrics that were woven, even the exact number of threads in each weave was prescribed, and a widespread police system saw to it that every prescription was meticulously observed. Violations were strictly dealt with, being punished by confiscation or destruction of the goods. In serious cases, destruction of tools and workshops, mutilation of offenders, even the death penalty were employed. That under such circumstances the entire industrial system of the country must have been crippled is clear. Just as under serfdom agricultural production constantly diminished, so the royal ordinances destroyed industry and drove the country toward the abyss. Only the revolution put an end to this insane condition. But one chain not even the revolution could break, the chain of authoritarian tradition, the basic principle of absolutism. It changed the old forms, it is true, but the deeper purport was not touched, and it merely continued what the monarchy had begun long before. Just as today in Russia, Bolshevism carries to the extreme the authoritarian state concept of czarism by suppressing indiscriminately all free exchange of ideas and therefore all creative impulse in the people, so then the Jacobins carried the political centralization of society to its ultimate conclusion, and so became, like their later imitators in Russia, the real leaders of the counter-revolution. The revolution gave France the republic, but this could have meaning only if it represented the opposite of autocracy, and safeguarded right with the same determination with which the monarchy had hitherto safeguarded power. The republic must become the symbol of the true community of the people, in which every movement really comes from the people and rests on the freedom of man. To the royal dictum, I am the state, the republican enfranchisement must reply, we are the community. Man must come to feel that he is no longer bound by the decisions of a higher power, that his fate from now on rests in his own hands, and in his cooperation with his fellows. The Republic could bring to the people something genuinely new only by replacing the ancient principle of guardianship with the creative activity of freedom, intellectual coercion by education for intellectual independence, the mechanical operation of a directing power by organic evolution. The revolution did indeed free the people from the yoke of royal power, but in doing so it merely plunged them into deeper bondage to the national state. 
and this chain proved more effective than the straitjacket of the absolute monarchy because it anchored not to the person of the ruler, but to the abstract idea of the common will, which sought to fit all efforts of the people to a definite norm. Thus, they landed happily back in the old absolutism that they thought they had overthrown. As the galley slave dragged the ball at his leg, so the new citizen dragged through life the abstract idea of the nation, which had been set up as the reservoir of the common will, and doing this forgot the art of standing on his own feet, which the revolution had scarcely restored to him. The Republicans gave to the Republic as content absolutism, dressed up as the nation, and so destroyed the genuine community of the people of the res publica. What the men of the convention had begun, their imitators in all subsequent popular uprisings, followed undeviatingly. They retained absolutism under the name of freedom, and followed slavishly the tradition of the great revolution, whose counterfeit glory still today outshines all the signs and symbols of genuine liberation. Proudhon had understood this truth in its full profundity. To him, therefore, all the efforts of political parties to get power into their hands were simply different demonstrations of absolutism under false colors. He had come to see that anyone who undertakes a social revolution by the conquest of political power comes inevitably to deceive himself and others, for power is in its very essence counter-revolutionary, an outgrowth of the concepts of absolutism, in which every system of exploitation has its roots. Absolutism is the principle of authority, which is most logically represented in the state and the church. Until this principle is overthrown, the so-called culture nations will continue to sink deeper and deeper into the bog of power politics and a dead industrial technique. This, too, at the cost of that freedom and manhood out of which alone there can grow for us a higher social culture. Ibsen felt this when he said, The state must go, nor will I have anything to do with revolution. Undermine the state concept, establish free choice and its intellectual implications as the sole determinant for a union. That is the beginning of a freedom that is worth something. A change in the form of government is nothing but a fussing about degrees. A little more, or a little less, all of it's just nonsense. Yes, my dear friend, all that counts is not to let yourself be frightened by the venerableness of ownership. The state had its roots in time. It will reach its growth in time. Greater things than it will fall. All religion will fall. The same experiences run through the history of all peoples. They lead everywhere to the same results. National political unity has never and nowhere vitalized the development of the intellectual culture of a people. On the contrary, it has always set limits to it, because it always sacrifices the best forces in the people as a whole to the unlimited ambition for power of the national state, and so dries up the deeper sources of intellectual progress. As we have seen, the periods of so-called national disunion have always been up to now the great culture periods of history, while the epochs of national unity have always brought degradation and ruin to all the higher culture forms. In ancient Germany, culture reached its zenith in the free cities of the Middle Ages, in the midst of a world of cultureless barbarism. They were the only places where art and handicraft could expand, where free thought still had a place and a social spirit kept men united. The mighty monuments of medieval architecture and art are still great witnesses to a cultural development which belonged among the most glorious that German history can display. But the history of the more recent intellectual culture in Germany is also only a confirmation of that old truth which so few, alas, have thus far understood. All great intellectual achievements in this country hark back to the time of its national disunion. Its classic literature, from Klopstock to Schiller and Goethe, the art of its romantic school, its classic philosophy from Kant to Feuerbach and Nietzsche, its music from Beethoven to Richard Wagner, all of it falls in the time before the founding of the Reich. With the victory of the German national state begins also the decline of German culture, the drying up of its creative forces, and along with this collapse the triumph of Bismarckism, as Bakunin has styled the senseless combination of militarism and bureaucracy. Nietzsche was quite right when he said, When the Germans began to interest the other peoples of Europe, it was because of a culture which they now no longer possess, yes, which they have, with blind zeal, shaken off as if it were a disease, and yet they know of nothing better to put in its place than political and national delusion. And Constantine Franz, the South German Federalist and opponent of Bismarck, opines, One needs but contemplate the situation existing today in every field of art, which the proclamation of the new empire at Versailles represents. 
and the nature of this new creation stands out with all desired clarity. A company in glittering uniforms, before which a few gentlemen in black coats play an utterly humble part, the whole as prosaic as it is unfolklike. The inauguration of militarism could not reveal itself more drastically. In fact, national unity turned Germany into an enlarged Prussia, which felt itself called to pursue world politics. The barracks became the high school of the new German mentality. Germany became great in the fields of technique and applied sciences, but narrow-minded and poor of soul. Worst of all, she lost that great universal attitude of Lessing, Herder, Goethe, Schiller, Jean-Paul, and Heine, which once had been the pride of the Germans. This is not a plea either for particularism or for the small state. What we urge is the complete elimination of the power principle from the life of society and, consequently, the supplanting of the state in every form by a higher social culture, founded on the freedom of man and his free union with his fellow men. This does not, however, alter the fact that the larger a state is, the stronger the instruments of power which it commands, the more dangerous it is to human freedom and the demands for higher forms of intellectual and cultural life. These are most imperiled in a central, unified state. Carlo Pisacane had recognized this clearly when he wrote in his Saggio sulla Revolution, Every government, even a despotism, is once in a while in a position to advance science and to attract to it brilliant men and great minds. Be it thus to make some concessions to the spirit of the time, be it because this accords with the personal ambitions of the head of state, from this one can deduce the fact that the more governments there are in a country, the greater is the probability that the general darkness will be illuminated by at least a few sparks of intelligence. One could perhaps cite England as counter-evidence and show that here culture took a great upsurge in spite of the national state, especially in the age of Queen Elizabeth, but one must not forget that only under the Stuarts was genuine absolutism able to claim an overwhelming success there and that the English state never succeeded in centralizing public life to the degree which was reached in France, for example. The English government had always a strongly developed liberal opposition against it, which was deeply rooted in the people and which gave to the whole of English history its peculiar character. The fact is that in no other country did so much of the ancient municipal constitutions persist as in England, and that the English city government is today, so far as local independence is concerned, the freest in Europe but that in England also the central powers of the state were always trying to shackle the economic and cultural life of the country, and that the shackles were only broken by the revolution has already been more fully developed in the first part of this work. In his political masterpiece Du Principe Federatif, Proudhon gave expression to the thought, Either the twentieth century will introduce the era of federation, or mankind will be plunged for another thousand years into purgatory. The true problem which delays the redemption is in reality no longer the political but the economic problem. Now the 20th century has thus far brought us not federalism, but an unlimited strengthening of centralization. Whither this development of matters has led us, the world war showed. It is shown also by the frightful chaos of our political and economic conditions, by the startling unspirituality of the time, and by the complete lack of any higher cultural feeling. We find ourselves actually in purgatory, and no one can predict when the hour of our redemption will sound, but that the solution of the problem of which Proudhon spoke is possible only within the framework of a federation of free communes on the basis of social community interests is becoming today more and more an inner certainty for everyone who has recognized the dangers of the immediate future and does not wish to throttle man slowly with state capitalism. This has been a production of Audible Anarchist. You can find more Audible Anarchist on YouTube.